Hello. So welcome to the YA Big Meeting. And so <clears throat> today the first part of the meeting will be a guest lecture by Ricky Chung. And so Ricky is the current YA VP of STEM. And he is also a top scorer in the 2021 USA Fall. And so can Ricky please start uh, start the lecture now? Um, hello everyone, I'm Ricky. And today um, I'm going to be doing a special uh, guest lecture on the special theory of relativity. So um, yeah, let's get started. Um, Um, okay. All right, so um, uh, the special theory of relativity, um, it, might, it might sound scary at first, especially if you have never actually uh, done any physics before, but um, here, we, here uh, the point of this is to show how we can derive some of the basic um, principles uh, in, the, in the theory of relativity um, for, with some very basic, with some very simple methods um, from some uh, very simple like um, postulates about relativity. So um, we'll show how relativity is derived and that it really is not um, all that scary as you might think if you think it is scary, if you haven't learned physics yet. So uh, you should be able to understand this if you haven't, if even if you haven't learned any physics. Okay, so um, all right, let's start with um, so uh, basically um, the relative the uh, basically everything in this theory of relativity can be derived from uh, two postulates. Uh, the first of these postulates is that um, from the first of is that is that the is that the speed of light is always um, is always um, has the same value. in every inertial frame. Uh, so first, an inertial frame is just a frame of like reference from where an observer can observe some things. So for example, we are in uh, an inert, uh, and the inertial frame has to, is, it's a frame of reference that's moving at a, uh, constant velocity. So we are in an inertial frame right now. That is the frame of reference um, of like a person standing on earth and it's moving through space. And um, it's basically like, um, uh, um, it's basically like, um, well, well, I think it's better explained if I give an example of what this means. Uh, so suppose we have a person on the ground. This person is in one inertial frame that we can just call this the lab frame or the um, lab frame. It's just a person who's on the ground. And we also, and the person is observing a, like suppose we have like a um, plane or like a plane that's moving relative to this person with some velocity v. And suppose there is another observer in this plane. And so this observer is in is is also in another is in a different ref inertial frame. That's the frame of the, this plane. And to this observer, the um to this observer, all of uh the 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 entire well Okay, how do I explain this? To this observer, everything in the plane is like station. The plane is stationary since he is in the inertial frame of this plane. And um, yeah, so um, 
So basically what this means is that if the person in the plane has like a light, uh, light source and he sends out a, um, a beam of light in some direction, this person will observe the beam of light to have a speed of C. Um, uh, yeah, the, if this person will observe that, that beam to have a speed of C, and the person who's in another inertial frame, if he looks at this person that's in the plane, uh, if he looks at the beam of light that is sent out by, by this person, he will also see um, the light to have a speed of C. So um, that's kind of uh, counterintuitive because um, in, in, um, in like ordinary everyday things, if the person in the plane like throw um, like shoots a bullet with some speed C, then he will speed see the bullet have a speed C, but but a person on the ground will see it having a speed of C plus V. But in this but in the case of um, light, light this uh, um, the person on the ground will not see the light beam have a speed having a speed of C plus V, instead he will see the light beam having a speed of C. So that's the first postulate. And these postulates, like they can't really, they, they are, um, we know these postulates are true because experiments have all shown that these postulates are true. Um, like for example, the Michelson-Morley experiment, which basically had two uh, sent out, had like it was basically uh, a contraption with like one one um, with two two like that sends out two beams of light at a right angle. One of the beam one of the uh, beams of light will be was sent out in the direction of the. Um, in the same direction as the Earth's um, movement, and the other beam of light. Okay, wait. one beam of light was sent out in the same direction as the Earth's movement. So, if this contraption is put on Earth, if the Earth has a speed v in that direction, one beam of light is sent out in the same direction as that speed v, and the other beam of light is sent out like towards the pole, so perpendicular to this um, from classical um from classical like if we just look at like if we assume if from like classical mechanics then the beam that it's in the same direction uh they these beams of light will have different speeds if we look at it from like a classical mechanics view but uh, um since this beam is in the same direction as the earth it will have a speed of c plus v where V is the speed of the Earth, and this will only have a have a um, this will only have a speed of C. But but as it turns out, they could there was no observed difference in the velocities of the light. Instead of this having a velocity of C plus V, it'll just also add a velocity of C. So uh, that's like one experimental evidence for how the speed of light is same in every inertial frame uh, yeah and the set and uh, there there's two so this is the first postulate in relativity there's two postulates the second postulate is that um, is that like every uh, inertial frame is uh, the same or like equivalent uh equivalent so essentially basically this one's like less counterintuitive as the speed of light thing right because essentially in if we have like a person in a frame that's like um well if we have a person uh, an observer who's in like a certain frame let's call this a uh, we have another observer in a different frame. Uh, let's, and if we have like another observer in a different frame, B, um, well, these two frames are equivalent. So every, so 
And uh, let's suppose that B is moving with speed, with a velocity of V relative to A. These, um, these frames are equivalent. So essentially, a person A, a uh, person in, in his frame A will feel, will like observe um, the act, the same phen phenomenon as the person in the uh, B frame, because essentially, um, yeah. So like if the person in, in the A frame, it just looks at everything um, in A, he can't figure out if he's moving or not. And the person in the B frame, uh, if the person in the B frame like will believe he is uh, stationary and at rest, and that the person and um, and will and he can't observe himself moving. So um, I'm not sure if that was a clear explanation, but essentially every reference frame is the same to the person in the B frame. The person in the A frame is moving backwards with a velocity of v, so he can't tell that he is he is the one moving. In fact, uh, you can't tell if if like you are the um, absolute frame or uh, like there's no like special frames frames of references. There, there's no frame that is definitely stationary. All the frames are relative to each other. That's basically what this postulate says. I don't know if that was a clear explanation. If it what if it's not clear, then uh, please ask. Um, anyway, let's go on to some of the, to some of the, um, results of these two postulates. So, um, we can, so from these two postulates, we can derive like a large number of different results. Um, yeah. So let's look at some of them. One important result from these two, po from this is, um, is there is the phenomenon of time dilation uh, this comes from these two uh, from the two postulates in relativity so uh, let's look at what this is and how this comes about so basically imagine if we have uh, one at reference frame uh, okay wait so if uh, suppose we have like one reference frame. Uh, let's call this reference frame S. And we have another reference frame. And this, okay, uh, wait. Um, okay, wait, no, never mind. Uh, suppose we have a, uh, hold on. Okay. Okay, wait. Uh, okay, so uh, basically, suppose that we have like a, a spacecraft, and on this space, and um, we have two observers. Uh, one is observer um, A. He is on the spacecraft, so he is in the spacecraft's reference frame. And we have another observer, B, who is not on the spacecraft. He is in a different reference frame. And the spacecraft is moving with a velocity of V with respect to B. And we can, and here, time dilation is basically these two observers will, me or will measure uh, different times. So uh, let's see how that works. Suppose we have a clock in this spacecraft. And let's suppose that we have a very special kind of clock. That's not the kind of clocks we usually use. It's basically, uh, the clock basically, okay. The clock basically is uh, two mirrors and we have a light beam that bounces. Uh, let's say the mirrors are separated by a distance of um, L and a light beam bounces between these two mirrors and every time a light beam like strikes one of the mirrors let's say that's uh, one second um, let's yeah let's okay 
um, wait, yeah. Let's say every time the light beam goes from one mirror and strikes the other mirror, that's that means one second has passed. Then, um, so the so we just have a light beam bouncing between these two mirrors, and and from each bounce, we just count another second. Okay, uh, simple, right? And um, yeah. So suppose we put this kind of clock on the spacecraft, and we uh, let the two people, we let A and B both look at the clock. For A, let's look at what the clock looks like from the point of view of uh, per of observer A. Well, he's on the spacecraft, and the clock is also on the spacecraft, so he'll just see the light beam bouncing in a in a, a bouncing perpendicularly. To, between the two mirrors. So they'll just bounce um, and they'll all stay, uh, ver the light beam will be vertical. Then um, the amount of time he measures will be, um, and he will measure a time. Okay, let's suppose he measures a time of, um, let's suppose he measures a time of T. Um, yeah, then uh, suppose, okay, um, okay. Suppose like t is one second for for pers for observer A. Then one second is just the time it takes for the light beam to go between these two mirrors. So t is just L over C. T is uh, one second for observer A. Now let's suppose B looks at the clock from um, on on this uh, spacecraft. Uh, instead of seeing the light beam, uh, B will not see the light beam. Um, rem for B, the light beam will not always be perpendicular to the two mirrors, because since this um, since this spacecraft is moving, B will observe the light to have to. Uh, since the spacecraft is moving, if we have a like a photon here. For since the spacecraft is moving, for B, the photon will also have a perpendicular velocity. It will move in the same direction. Uh, it will um, have, yeah, for B, the, so instead of seeing the light beam remaining perpendicular to the mirrors, B will see that the light traces out a path that looks somewhat like this. So essentially, as the light beam bounces between the two mirrors, um, it will be slanted because the spacecraft is moving horizontally. Um, and that changes uh, the amount of time that B sees. Because from our first postulate, um, the speed of light will always have the same value in every reference frame. Now the light is moving in this direction uh, is moving like diagonally. So B will see this, but B will, but B will continue seeing the light as having the same speed uh, C. So, but now it's moving diagonally. Uh, normally, if instead of a light beam, uh, it was instead suppose like a, a base, a ball bouncing between uh, two plates. Normally uh, B, if, if it were just a ball, then, then the horizontal velocity of the ball would still be C, and then this velocity will be like um, uh, something else. But since it's a light beam, and uh, light always will always uh, be measured to have the same value no matter the reference frame, the light beam will um, B will still see the light beam as having a velocity of C. So then the B, so then, um, yeah, um, for B, observer B, the light beam will have a velocity, uh, um, will have, there will be horizontal and a vertical part component for the light beam. Uh, we know that the horizontal component of the, of the, um, of the velocity of this, uh, light beam will be V, the velocity of the spacecraft. And since the diagonal like part here has a velocity of C, 
this vertical component from Pythagorean theorem is just c squared minus v squared. So if b measures one second as the time it takes for the light to bounce between these two mirrors, he uh, supposed that his suppose that one second for b is t prime. Then he will measure the light to have a um, t prime to be l over square root c squared minus v squared because for b the horizontal um, velocity of the light be I'm not the horizontal the vertical um, velocity of the light beam will be square root c squared minus v squared. So as you can see, the second measured by observer A and B are clearly different. And we also know the um, ratio of this difference. If we take like, uh, so, and we also know that uh, T prime, and if we like divide these two equations, we get that um, T prime is equal to um, t divided by square root one minus v squared over c squared. Um, yeah, and we also, sometimes we also call, um, sometimes we also, since, okay, this constant one over, well, not constant, this like value of one over square root one minus v squared over c squared is used a lot in relativity so uh, it has a special name. We sometimes call it gamma is equal to this. So from that, we basically have T prime. Okay, wait. Yeah, so from that, we also have T prime is equal to gamma. Wait, okay. Is equal to gamma times T. So essentially, for like, um, so essentially, if if observer A measures a certain time t, then observe in that time, observe if B also measures a time in that time, they will have a they will measure different times. Um, a will measure if A measures a time of t, then in that in that same uh, amount of time, B will also will measure a time of gamma times t of t over one minus one over of t over square root one minus v squared over c squared. And um, and uh, this, this uh, principle, this, yeah, so basically, and um, if A has like a, a different type of clock, like just a normal clock instead of this special clock, he will, there, he will, they will still, um, it will still the if, yeah. So um, this clock might might seem to be a very special clock. So it might seem like this is a special case, but it really isn't because if A has a different clock, that clock must measure. If A has like a different clock, and it's a normal clock, then that clock must measure the same time as this special clock measures because otherwise if they do not measure uh, the same time, A could potentially figure out that his reference frame is moving. But from our second postulate, the, the, there are no special, from our, spe the second postulate implies that a person inside a reference frame cannot figure out that, but inside an inertial frame cannot figure out that uh, their inertial frame is moving. Okay, so any questions about this? We have, because of time dilation, we have that uh, B uh, stationary, if an observer looks at another observer, if an observer is moving and an observer is stationary, they will measure different times and the times will have a ratio of gamma. Are there any questions? Okay, let's move on. Um, so let's look at another effect of these two postulates. That is uh, length contraction. Basically, in our in time dilation, uh, two observers in different reference frames will measure different times. But now with length contraction, 
two observers in different reference frames will measure different lengths. Uh, if they measure the length of the same thing, they will measure different lengths. So let's look at how that works. Uh, yeah, so we basically have the same thing. We have like, suppose we have like a train and this train is moving with velocity V and we have an observer A in this train and he has to measure something. Um, oh yeah, and we also have an observer B and let's say the observer B is like stationary and the, um, the train is moving with a velocity of V relative to B. If they measure, um, yeah, okay. So um, suppose, so here we look at length contraction. Suppose we have like some object on the train. So uh, let's say it's on the train. So um, A is stationary relative to this object. Let's say it has a length, um, okay, wait. Um, let's say it has a length of L prime relative to A and uh, L relative to B, I think. Uh, oh wait, never mind. Um, hold on. Yeah, let's say that this object has a length of L prime relative to A and a length of L relative to B. Um, okay, so, so if B looks at this object, he will look, he will observe it to have a length of L. Um, so, um, let's, let's see how they will measure different, um, lengths for this object. Suppose A measures the object in, um, this way. He puts a mirror at the end of the object. Then he has it, he shoots a light beam at the mirror and lets it bounce back. And from this, from the time it takes for the light beam to travel that distance, he will um, measure the um, um, okay. Um, let's say from the time it takes for his, for the light beam to travel. From, from his light source to the mirror and bounce back. Uh, let's say he takes that time and he and he use and he like multiplies it by the speed of light to find the to find L prime. Uh, yeah. So um, let's look at the time it takes in um, A's frame. Uh, suppose it takes a time of T prime in his frame. Then T prime. Well, that's easy. The time T prime is just to L prime over uh, C because um, the light travels a length of two L prime and uh, it has a velocity of C. So he measures T prime to be two L prime by C over C and then he can probably multiply by C and divide by two to find L prime. Uh, he measures the time T prime. But uh, let's suppose um, B looks at this object. B also, looks at A's light beam and sees and um, okay well let's suppose like okay let's look at how B measures the length of this uh, object uh, he he also looks at A's light beam so he's also looking at like yeah um, he also measures it by taking the amount of time it takes for the light beam to hit the mirror and then bounce back um, so he so he's basically using A's um, measurement, uh, A's method of measuring, basically. And suppose B measures the time of T. Um, so let's look at what this is. Okay, wait. But because of relativity, it will have some special. It will be different from A. Uh, let's look at the time it takes for the light light to go to the mirror from B's uh, perspective. Um, from B's perspective, the light will have a speed of C, but the um, the even though the the train is moving, the light will have a speed of C um, from B's perspective. But the mirror, since the train is moving, the mirror is also moving. 
um, from B's perspective. It, it will have a speed of V. So um, the mirror is moving away uh, from the light, um, from the light source. So it's so from B's perspective, the relative speed of the light and the mirror is C plus V. Uh, is C plus V. So um, then the time that B measures, um, the time that B measures is just L over C plus V. Uh, suppose that we are of course assuming that this object has a length of L from B's perspective. So that's the time it takes for the light to reach the mirror. It's L over C plus V because the mirror is also moving away from the light. Now, when the light, now let's look at the time it takes for the for the light to come back to like bounce back. It the light still has a velocity of c from b's perspective. B still sees the light as having a velocity of c from the um from our prince from our first postulate. But now, since like suppose there's a detector here, the detector at the opposite end, the detector is how A detects when the light has returned. Now the light, the detector, because it's on a string, is moving towards the light with a velocity of V. So the relative speed of the light and the detector is, will be C minus V since they're moving towards each other. So that means that the time it takes for this, uh, for the light to return is L over, is L divided by C minus V. Um, that's the amount of time it takes for the light to go from the mirror uh, and reach the detector. Understand? Um, yeah. So then B measures a time of, we can simplify this a bit. This is just C squared minus B squared and then times uh, 2CL, I think. Yeah. So the time that observer B measures is 2CL over C squared minus V squared. And uh, we, so yeah. So now we can find the, the difference between L and L prime. Uh, we know from earlier, we know from earlier from time dilation that um, T is equal to gamma T prime. Uh, the amount of time that uh, since they're measuring like the same thing, uh, they're measuring the same uh, two. The they're measuring this the distance between the same two events. So um, they measure the time they measured um, will be will be related by t equal is equal to gamma times t prime um, because they're measuring the same like events. So from here, so from these two. Uh, equations t equals this and t prime equals this, we can, uh, now we can see, um, we can basically um, like divide these two and we have like gamma is equal to, um, um, to this, wait. Hold on. Gamma is equal to um, C over C squared minus V squared times L over L prime. So uh, from this, we can see that L is equal to, um, uh, well, since gamma is equal, gamma is equal to one over square root one minus V squared over C squared, of course. So we see L is equal to, L prime over gamma, I believe. So this is a uh, length. So this is length contraction. If we have an object in a reference frame that's moving with, well, suppose if we have an object that's like moving with respect to someone. Uh, yeah. Okay. Wait. Basic. Basically, if 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 person A measures the length of an object. It and he measures the length of L prime, and if if per the the reference frame person A and this object is like if it's in a train and it's moving with velocity of v 
relative to person B. The length person A measures will be L prime and the length person B measures will be L, then L equal to L prime over gamma. Now uh, note something here. Gamma is equal to this. Um, in most case, like since uh, we all know like B is like less than C. So gamma is usually great is like greater than one. So essentially if a person who is stationary observes something that is moving relative to it and he measures this uh, object, his measurement will be um, less than the measurement of, of someone who measures this object when this, uh, okay, object is at rest, basically. Like an object, if someone is at rest relative to this object and he measures the length of this object, he will get a, um, he will get a measurement. And if the object is moving relative to someone else, he will get a measurement. The, pers the person who observes the moving object will have will measure the object to have a uh, smaller length than the person who is who measures the object when he is at rest relative to the, to the object, basically. Um, yeah, so yeah, uh, wait, okay. Um, oh, and another important thing is that the length contraction only occurs if he measures the length of the object that is, that is like, it only occurs if the length of the object is in the same, uh, how can I say it, direction as the object's motion. Like if instead of measuring the horizontal length of this object, person A measures the vertical length of this object and person B also measures the vertical length of this object and this object is moving with speed V, they will not have this length contraction factor here. They will still, they will measure the same, um, same length because if that's, if the uh, length they're measuring is perpendicular to the velocity of the object, I think. Any questions? Okay. Uh, if, okay. I think we have time to, uh, let's go over one more effect of this, of this, uh, of these two postulates. This is a loss of simultaneity. Essentially, if we have a, um, essentially like, so basically that's essentially if two, if two events happen at the same time for one person, they might not necessarily, they, they don't necessarily, um, well, if one person observes two events at the same time, it, he, another person, a person in a different reference frame will not necessarily observe um, the events happening at the same time. So um, essentially, okay, let's look at an example of, um, of this. So suppose we have like a train and we have a person who is on the train. So he is in the reference frame of the train. And, um, and suppose we put a, and suppose we have another uh, observer who is not on the train and the train is moving with a velocity of V relative to observer B. Um, suppose we have a light source in the middle of this train. Uh, yeah, let's suppose that the train has a, um, okay, wait, hold on. Uh, hold on, how do I put, how do, I, okay. Yeah, suppose we have a light source in the middle of the train and the and the light source sends out two beams of light at the same time towards the opposite ends of the train. So these are beams of light. And uh, uh, observer A on the train will observe the, the beams of light um, hitting the ends of this, um, will observe these beams arriving at the ends of the train at the same time 
right? Because um, observer A will, because basically for observer A, these uh, these beams of light will, uh, okay. Yeah, well, he will, uh, okay, let's suppose that the train has a, okay, wait, hold on. Let's suppose that the train has a length of 2L prime relative to observer A as we, and that, so so that uh, this light, uh, beam of light is in the middle. So one one of the things here, one, one the length for the beam on the left is L prime, and this is also L prime. Okay, um, and suppose that the train has a length of 2L relative to observer B, because uh, clearly, obviously, uh, they would be observer B and observer A will measure different lengths. So this is L and this is L. Um, for observer A, both of these light beams will arrive at the ends of the train in a time of L prime over C, right? It's just L prime over C because both of these light beams have a speed of c and they travel a distance of l prime but for observer b let's look at the light beam on the right um for observer b the light beam on the right has a velocity of c he will observe this light beam as having a velocity of c not c plus v uh c because of our first postulate Normally, if it were just like a normal object thrown in the direction of the train, uh, B will observe it having a velocity of like C plus V, but this is light. So he will always see the light having a speed of C. But now, since the train is moving with a velocity of V, uh, the relative velocity between the light and the right end of the train is C plus V. So now the time it takes for the beam of light on the right, wait, uh, C plus, no, I, not C plus V, C minus V, sorry. Since the, since the train is moving away from the light, essentially, that's the relative velocity of the light beam and the right end of the train. So the num the amount, the, the, the time it takes for the light, for the right, the light beam on the right to reach the right end of the train is L over C minus V. But, uh, but the amount of time it take, but if we look at the light beam on the left, uh, to observer B, it will also have a velocity of C. Um, since you always, since everyone will always see the light moving at velocity of C. But now since the train is moving to the right. The left end of the train is moving to the right with a velocity of V. So the relative velocity of the um of the of the like of the 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 relative velocity of the left end of, of the train and the light beam will be C plus V since they're moving towards each other. So for observer B the time it takes for um, the B light beam on the left to reach the le left end of the train is L over C plus V. Now, as you can see, the time it takes for the uh, light, the beam on the right to reach the right end of the train is L over C minus V, but the time it takes for the le beam on the left to reach the left end of the train is L over C plus V. Those are two different times. So for observer B, the light will reach the two ends of the train. Um, will reach the two ends of the train at different times. But for observer A, they will reach the two ends of the train at the same time at in time of L prime over C. So uh, the light. So for observer A, the the light beams reaching the end of the trains will be simultaneous, but for observer B, they will not be same simultaneous. It will take different times. So that's what we call loss of simultaneity. So these are the three um, most fundamental effects of these two postulates. And from these two, from these effects, we can derive all sorts of uh, new, like, things, new, uh, 
all sorts of like stuff about relativity, such as the Lorentz transformations, which are basically the transformation of one reference frame to another. And um, those are like important for calculations in relativity. And um, yeah, so from these, those are, these are the time dilation, length contraction and loss of simultaneity are the most important, are the three most fundamental effects of those two postulates. And from those three, we can get a whole lot of other um, effects in relativity, like Lorentz contraction, but we have run out of time and we will not go over them uh, today. Yeah, so um, yeah, thank you. For, thank you everyone for listening.